So, um, the next keynote um, is about uh, politics. Um, and in particular, free software campaigning, the Euro uh, what can be done at the European level, and so forth. Um, the speaker is uh, Amelia Andersdotter. So, hello. Um, I guess it's not morning anymore but good morning to all of you anyway I guess many of you had a late night yesterday and are just waking up my name is Amelia Andersdotter um, I'm here to speak today as um, uh, active in the European Parliament I'm not a lawyer by training and I dedicate myself primarily to policy work and I followed free software and policy work around free software for quite some time um, it is, in fact, one of the main reasons that I became politically involved in the first place. So, the institution in which I work is one out of three institutions that make legally binding decisions in the European Union. What do I mean by legally binding? Well, so, we write laws, and they later hopefully apply to the people and public authorities and the companies that are active in the European Union. The other two institutions are the European Commission, which is what we call like an executive body. Um, when we in the Parliament have made a law, uh, the European Commission try to ascertain that the laws we've made are actually implemented correctly in all the member states and enforced. Um, they also have a single right of initiative on proposing legislation. So this means that uh, when we in the Parliament write the law, actually we don't write it from scratch. Uh, it's more like we're analyzing and proposing changes to a proposal that was made by the European Commission. Um, so we have a third institution also, the Council of Ministers, and this is just kind of an international organization operated by the governments of the different member states. They also develop the general policy lines of the European Commission. So whenever the Commission makes a proposal for a law, it's not like they just grab it out of thin air on their own um, accord. They also actually have some kind of general political direction within which they can make these proposals. Um, but the Council of Ministers uh, operate through negotiations between ministers that come from the member state governments. So normally they have some bit of difficulty getting along because we now have 27 member states. So this is a lot of different wills in different directions that have to reconcile. Um, but essentially they can do the same thing that we do in the European Parliament, which is look at the text proposed by the European Commission. Say, uh, we don't like this word, we don't want the actual documentation, we want only the appropriate documentation or uh, maybe they want the adequate documentation, something like this, and they propose these amendments, we call them. Um, and then afterwards, the Parliament and the Council have to agree on the different proposals that they passed on these texts, and um, that is a very long and arduous process because often we make completely different objections to the Commission's proposals. Um, but I was hoping not to get too stuck in this general, this is how the EU works talk, so um, I will move on. It's just kind of important to know that general institutional framework in which we have to, to uh, or in which I have to work. So the first thing that is interesting to look at for software coders uh, is, of course, if they are at all affected by European legislation. Um, and they are in various ways, and I'm sure that you've already noticed, and probably many of you even dedicate a lot of time into thinking about how you're uh, affected by European legislation. Uh, but what I've noticed at previous editions of Bostem is that when I follow the legal track, uh, it's often unclear to free software coders which particular legislation they are affected by or even like which particular jurisdiction they are affected by. So we have some um, general laws that will normally cause a lot of upsetness and rage like the patent laws which are generally a mess not only for the software field but also for every other field um, or in general also like copyright or licensing schemes and maybe public procurement rules. Uh, but in the European developer communities, I've seen very extensive debates on, on American legislation and the problems caused by American legislation. So I sometimes get these emails from people who've seen um, maybe a lawsuit somewhere in the United States. They're very agitated with this because the sum that had to be paid for somebody infringing on a patent that was clearly bizarre uh, is very large. And that is actually not so relevant for um, a European software developer. Similarly, if you get an infringement claim which doesn't really have, like, you've infringed on this patent, please stop doing that. And the only thing that you have is basically a paper that says that, and it doesn't say which particular patent you infringed on, 
it doesn't say who sent you this claim or whatever. Like, the, I mean, it doesn't make sense to be really upset with this to me. Um, so this is something that, so that is something that I want to like immediately clarify. I work with European legislation. So uh, whatever happens in the US, I see as really not my field. And if you're planning to develop software in your European Union, probably you should not care about their legislation either because it doesn't really apply to you if you're in, in Europe. Uh, or at least you could claim that it doesn't, I feel. Um, so, I have to organize my papers. Um, so, of course, before I mention the European laws that affect free software, I have to quickly jump back into a procedural note again, and I apologize for that. So the European, make, European Union makes laws, and they will later normally be implemented in the member states. Um, and in the member states, you have courts which interpret the laws made by the member states in that member state. So when we make European law, this is a bit like fuzzy, and often it's not directly applied. Um, and very often there is also a great disparity between how the laws are implemented and actually upheld in the member states. And this is partially why we have the European Commission to ensure at least some type of regularity in this framework. Um, so that which I prim primarily know of and, and follow are political discussions at the European Union level um, that exist in Brussels. Um, and they're sometimes very far away from what would be the practical implemented version of these laws in the member states. Um, so I mentioned this as a safeguard not to hel be held to accountable later. If I make a description of reality that seems to you as if it's not close to what you are familiar with, it's probably because I know what we have been thinking about in Brussels, and then somebody at the member state level has been pondering what our intentions could be and just completely misunderstood our general directions. Um, the different laws that apply to software in Europe would include copyright laws, patent laws, public procurement rules, which define how the public sector makes purchases, um, to some extent at least. When we have the like, general industrial policy, of course, how we encourage the development of standards in the European Union, and also actually projects that we try to facilitate between the member states um, through research or e-government programs. Um, I could also add somewhere company law, which is partly governed, although patchedly, at the European level. We have eight or nine company directives that determine some common rules for how you make a startup or how you run a company in the various member states. But there actually, there's actually still a lot of differences. So if you're planning to be an entrepreneur in the European Union, looking at the European legislative framework normally isn't going to do you much good. You need to be aware of the conditions in your particular member state. Um, so if I start with copyright law and patent law, it's sometimes convenient to talk about both these legislative frameworks at the same time because they share this, some similarities, particularly in the enforcement. Also, the problem faced policy-wise are largely the same. The political discussions are very muddled with enforcement havoc and a relatively small amount of very large industrial actors are benefiting from publicly instituted market monopolies um, and are at least partially making life dif difficult for everyone else. It's also a legally complicated field since um, everything one deals with when talking about these issues is basically abstract. So if you're going to consider like a patent or, or a, a copyright, how, how would you tax the value of a copyright, for instance? Does it even have a value? Who decides what value it has? And at what point after its conception does it have a value? If you write a piece of code today, clearly that could, could become valuable in like six months or a year to somebody or even to many people, but how would you kind of tax that, that value? That would actually be kind of a problem if you're dealing with legislation or um, even running a company around this. Um, so in Europe, we have a special copyright law for software. Software code, therefore, isn't actually covered by copyright as such. It's covered by a European law which is based on the copyright law and dependent on the copyright law existing, but it has some special provisions which apply only to, to software code. Uh, in my country, which is Sweden, um, the software copyright directive is incorporated in the general copyright law, but as a special code which again only applies to software code. So one difference is that by default, software code which is written um, by any of you in the course of your employment will always fall on the employer. 
Uh, normally, you would expect this to be regulated in a contract between the employer and the employee. Uh, so again, like an example from my country, journalists always get the copyright for the texts that they've written. And in Sweden, the journalist gets to keep the copyright for their, uh, for their texts. Whereas, for instance, in Germany, you will have difficulties finding a publisher who doesn't say that if you are a journalist in my employment, um, any text that you write, the copyright will fall to me. Uh, but this is then, this is statutory with, with software. So you cannot be an employee in the European Union, as far as I understand, and write code and have it, the, the software still fall to you unless you did the code in your free time. Um, also, of course, for software programmers, the reality is that often you will have this clause in your employment contract anyway, because it's very com common for especially larger companies that, that apply for many patents or trademarks that normally those companies would not want to, their programmers to have a natural kind of right to, uh, to stop that. Um, and therefore, in the employment contract, it will say that uh, any immaterial rights or intangible assets that are derived from your employment will automatically fall to, to us, the employer. Um, so one of the things that is important to understand about Europe and the European Union is also that we have these 27, soon to be 28 member states that have their own legal systems and their own courts. And this means that something like a, a software license like the GPL, for instance, would have to be tried in all of those member states uh, before they can actually be, be valid. And this is like part of the general copyright law, like the general contract framework that in order for a contract to be va valid, like between an employer and an employee or so, it has to be declared valid by a court because this is the safeguard mechanisms we have in our systems of justice. Um, so um, a license is basically a contract between a rights holder and whoever is making claims on that which is contracted. Licensing has become an extremely common way of creating value in society and according to me a slightly arbitrary way of creating value since it's the only thing you're doing is basically establishing that some transaction will occur when somebody does something with a thing that is normally anyway easily possible for them to do and very cheap. Uh, copying movies or MP3s would be a perfect example um, of something which is extremely cheap and easy to do. Uh, but that we're trying to put into this transaction framework. Uh, but it's also a very different debate, so I will not talk about this too much. Um, contracts and licenses fall under the law. Uh, they exist because we recognize them and we assume that they're valid. And the courts of nation states are meant to intervene when two contracting parties have disputes over what the contract or the license actually requires those parties to do. So um, the courts will solve all of the conflicts but only for their particular jurisdiction. And the jurisdiction is normally just a member state. Uh, so through European legislation, we try to make the results of these conflict resolution mechanisms um, to not be entirely arbitrary between the member states, but with things that have very detailed provisions, like for instance, a GPL license or even a Creative Commons license, um, it can sometimes be very difficult to tell whether or not all parts of a license apply in all jurisdictions of the European Union. Uh, you could, for instance, imagine that if in one member state the licenses are completely upheld and the contract is seen as completely valid, in a different member state the courts will deem that according to our legislation, which has been implemented dif differently, only 80% of, of this license contract actually is valid. Um, so for the GPL2, there was an attempt to make a harmonized and interoperable license which was guaranteed to be valid in all of the member states. The interoperable European public license was actually the work of the European Commission and I think that they deserve some credit for that. And I think that also this is the type of things that we should want to see our public institutions doing. Um, but the GPL2 has also the feature of having been upheld in many different member states. So we will normally know like how is it, val how is it valid, where is it valid, which parts of it is valid and so forth. Um, I'm personally not aware of any cases where the GPL version 3 has been tried in European courts, uh, but anyone in the audience who is aware of such cases could please get in touch with me because I'd actually be very interested in seeing how European courts deal with that. Um, so other places where one might be interested in operability and openness uh, and work from public institutions other than licensing and contracting models for the subletting of software code is of course standards. So the easiest way to make as many people as possible able to interact with something relatively complex 
is to have that complexity, complexity described in some kind of documented format, which is open and freely available to people that want to interact. Um, in software, where it's comparatively easy and cheap to get started actually trying to do something um, that improves the life of you or um, your peers, um, open and freely accessible specifications are more beneficial than in other places. And the European Union does a lot of work with standards. Normally the Commission would deal with the standards and the Parliament will only kind of intervene when, when they set up the framework within which they do these activities. Um, and of course many of the standardization processes are for other parts of industry. So there's now a lot of discussion about open innovation and talk about access to specification for hardware and other things. Um, but different types of file formats and their various properties is definitely something that we bear in mind. Um, the European institutions themselves, for instance, publish always their documents in uh, machine-readable formats. This is kind of, well, the European Commission has a code which obliges them to do that now. Uh, all EU law and case law and treaties and many other things are published in HTML. Um, Microsoft Word documents and PDFs and that would be like the old Microsoft Word format because we're just starting to migrate into 2010 software now and our previous edition is from 2003. So um, some of you will wonder also why I make an example of an institution which publishes document in Microsoft Word. But it's actually interesting because um, it's more that there are three different formats to allow the maximum amount of, of kind of interaction from the citizens. So we have the machine readability in HTML, which is clearly open, and then we also have human readable, which is PDF, and that is also clearly open. Um, in the standardization procedures, we've gone on to talk a lot in Brussels lately about what we call fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing terms. Uh, so this is when a particular standard requires the implementation of something technical um, in order for the standard to be fulfilled, and that technical thing is covered by a patent, so you need to be developing a licensing model that makes it easy to acquire the suitable licenses for those patents at a reasonable price. So uh, the fair and non-discriminatory and reasonable basically means for the totality of patents that could potentially be mixed up in this standard, uh, you can get them at a price which doesn't kill your company or uh, your activities. Um, the technical term for this is FRAND, which is for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. Um, but now, FRAND doesn't solve too many problems, at least for software programmers. And the reason is that the FRAND-licensed patent pool typically will still only be available to a relatively small amount of actors on the market um, that may already be dominant. Uh, so it cuts into the opportunities for developers to make very small companies or launch their products or services commercially since there will be a license barrier and we are unable to kind of see the fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory as being uh, free in terms of like free as in free beer in this case. Um, so it, it will cost money and this is a barrier. Um, it was also actually never particularly obvious to the European Commission that licensing cooperation in terms of friend agreements or patent pools would at all be legal. Uh, one could imagine that if five big companies um, have been granted monopoly rights by a public institution and then they all join in one business standard association to help each other reinforce their position on the particular market by giving each other discounts on licenses, um, that would actually be some kind of cartel which, uh, which is a breach of the competition law framework in the European Union. Um, we have a very detailed framework for dealing with business standards associations and this type of licensing cooperation in European competition law um, ensures that it doesn't get cartelesque. Uh, the reason for this is that the patent system otherwise would cause much, much more problems than it is currently doing. So it puts the patent system in a very interesting light when we have to create special, con special solutions and deviations in our competition law framework to allow for what should reasonably be considered a cartel in order for the system not to actively damage industry. Um, but it's a political problem in, in that we, we really aren't capable of having any other discussions about this. Or like, uh, politically it's very difficult to move because there's too many industrial actors impacted by the system and whenever you try to do something about the patent law, and we've seen this also last year with the discussions about the unitary patent, they tug in too many directions and you can never make a compromise which will be entirely obvious to um, everyone, so this is uh, strange. Uh, 
So um, the last two points that, are, that I can just briefly mention are like public procurement. And this is a bit of a tricky legal area because we have many procurement directives in the European Union where we try to kind of steer how the public institutions of the various member states will be um, making purchases. Public procurement essentially is when a public body says, um, I want to have some service, but I don't want to develop it in-house, so I'm going to contract it in or buy it from a private actor. And because many member states in the European Union have, um, uh, they either discriminate geographically or they have problems with corruption, we make a lot of laws at the European level to make sure that uh, we get cross-border trade and that people don't discriminate each other based on geographical origin, that kind of thing. Um, in the current procurement discussions that we've had in the European Parliament, they were explicitly discussing how to make deviations from the public procurement rules on geographical discrimination if this was for social or for environmental purposes. Uh, in the ICT solutions, still we don't have any, um, we don't have this ambition to kind of go towards specifically open formats. So even if generally we will have a kind of large political support for that, uh, we don't actually put it in the legislation. So it's not really a reason to make a deviation from the principle that a public institution should always buy the most cheap thing because the, buying the cheapest contractor is seen as the most responsible way of dealing with the citizens' money in the European Union. Um, also for the uh, e-government services that I can bring up very briefly, um, these are normally big projects launched by the European Commission to help the member states implement some kind of feature that will make the member states more interoperable so that if you move from Sweden to Belgium, for instance, um, you will be able to interact with public institutions in approximately the same way that you used to do when you were growing up. Um, and the European Commission, of course, concluded that the best way of making all of the member states implement these things was to actually make them open source because that way the European Commission can give them away for free and also you can provide the local authorities to kind of change the software so it becomes more convenient for everyone to do it that way. Um, and so the European Commission makes a lot of kind of fluffy proposals like the European patent, the unitary patent obviously came from them but to their credit they have a lot of different units and some of the units do a lot of great work and I think the e-government unit for instance is one of those institutions. So what is really difficult with all of the above topics from the perspective of free software is kind of that free software is not really a widespread phenomenon and software programming in particular definitely is not. So the interests in the free software community aren't always congruent also. So somebody who will develop free software in their free time is likely to have very different requirements on the legislation and um, the regulatory framework in which they act from somebody who is programming a commercial phone exchange targeting business operations, that is, they are targeting other businesses with their products, or uh, somebody who is, for instance, developing market, who is trying to market web browsers to end consumers, or for that matter, modules to try and take care of agricultural technologies that ensure the well-being of cattle. Um, so one thing that I've seen happening in the policy making process though is that um, the openness and freedom in software infrastructures has a lot of political support. And this is something also that the free software community as far as I've seen often underestimate. Um, politically we have gov governments and like high up government representatives and even ministers, deputies in the European Parliament and legislators not having a problem at all supporting open standards, open source software, even free software and deployment of these in, in different localities. So what we lack is actually more deployment of these tools or even access to it. We have a um, supplier shortage and very often when people decide that they want to go open, they don't have anywhere to, to turn to because they don't, they don't have the right networks or they don't know actually how. Um, in the laws also it's very difficult because we, we cannot always overview the results of what we're doing. So we were discussing the standards directive in 2011, for instance, and we did introduce wording of fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing. And that intervention makes sense if one aims to deal with the symptom and make a particular standard upsetting circumstance less severe. Because the patent system as such, really it's a horrible mess. And politically dealing with this is next to impossible. It's, there's too many interest groups that they go everywhere and even if it is the cause of many problems, 
um, it's very, very difficult to change, and the friend licensing at least partially mitigates that. Uh, also, the friend licensing terms is presented by industry as something that uh, fixes problems that are very noticeable by end consumers, such as super large con injunctions in, um, in the Netherlands, for instance. Um, so um, it doesn't deal with the underlying cause of the problem, and I think it shows that we have a bit of a failure in the political system also, because we really kind of lack direction when we're unable to deal with the law that obviously causes problems. Um, so uh, the political system and institutions have a very hard time admitting to themselves also that there may be problems in a legislative framework that they cannot address. Um, so we get hacks rather than cures, and even when we know perfectly well what the cure to the particular problem we're facing might be, um, we cannot admit to ourselves that we're actually unable to discuss the problem to begin with. Um, so there's another thing that I've seen also is that essentially um, well-intending proposals end up getting worded wrong. This is more like a technical legal detail. Like technology neutral, for instance, is a term that we use in public procurement to describe a procurement process wherein which no technologies are discriminated against in, in procurement calls or, or tenders. So a public institution would, for instance, make a tender for, I need this small application for making it more easy for people to apply for the permission to build a balcony on my house. Um, and if that is technology neutral, doesn't that kind of mean that you're not allowed to discriminate between proprietary and free software? So even if you kind of implemented a software strategy in your municipality, technology neutrality in that case would kind of restrict your options because you have to see all of the offers as as equal. So I'm not sure, for instance, that I would always pick technology neutral laws. In many cases they're good and we want laws to be generally applicable. Um, but if it's about us making an investment in an infrastructural thing, like the software framework of a local authority, uh, I think we can afford ourselves the luxury of actually basing that decision at least partially on an ideological framework. Um, because in doing so, we'd be also choosing on which platforms our citizens and companies and local authorities could interact. Um, but it turns out, when I was discussing this in, in the public sector information directive, that was when, when this technology neutrality term came up, um, it turns out actually that everyone that I was talking to had a very strong support of open formats. And they wanted normally the public sector to go into open formats. And what they were actually afraid of was more that the European legislation would force local authorities to adopt formats that they w may not want or software solutions that they may not be ready to migrate into or whatever. So they were introducing this wording that at least according to me would have brought in a legal uncertainty for a local authority and how they can make strategies for implementing free software. Um, and we wouldn't want local authorities to suddenly panic and incur high costs uh, for software platform migration. Um, but right now we landed in the parliament at least on expressing a strong preference for open formats, which means that, well, we would prefer it if the local authority could investigate ways of taking the migration costs. Nobody will force them to do so, and if the public authorities at the local level don't care, the law doesn't actually oblige them to do so. Um, so in my opinion, because I discovered this and we had cross-political support also for the open source solution in the public sector, I believe that the political fight over open source and free software is more or less won. It's good to keep watch over like the details and legislation because we still have words like technology neutral that sound appealing but that may actually cause harm in some cases. Uh, but this is more like you know, detailed work. We don't really need to be afraid of, of deputies openly resisting open or free software anymore, even governments. Um, so uh, this is, what, if I were a free software programmer and I was going to get involved in European legislation making, I would kind of just gently nudge my politicians into thinking very carefully about exact phrasings uh, or maybe even try to get somebody who's in Brussels to do that for me. Because you don't, the ideological fight, I think, we need now providers and people who actually start approaching local authorities to make sure that they have the software solutions that actually they want. Um, and I would like to end on that note maybe that I think we need more free software providers that target public authorities in the European Union. 
and they need to be making connections with local authorities in particular and also government institutions so that there is actually something for these institutions to procure because at least when I've been talking to people in the European institutions, even when I meet people at local authorities, um, even when they support free software, they don't know where to go to get it. So um, thank you for allowing me to come and I hope that that was sufficiently optimistic. Um, if you have any questions, you can approach me later. Take some questions now. So, does anyone want to ask a question now? Yeah. Hello. Um, I think most of the people here are in favor of open source software, but we've just seen another attack on open source by Microsoft where uh, laptops that have been designed for Windows 8 have locked down the EFI so that you can no longer boot uh, in alternative operating systems. I see there was a question asked in the parliament about that. Have there been any answers yet? So, uh, interesting question. Actually, yes, I received the question in my inbox, the answer to that question in my inbox yesterday. And the Commission says that they haven't seen any competitive uh, distortions arising from the UEFI Secure Boot yet, but that they're monitoring the situation. Um, well, why would you laugh at that? It's good, they're monitoring the situation. So, um, but the answer, unfortunately, has been transmitted to me in Swedish, my native language. It should be published on the European Parliament website sometime soon, and it answers both of those questions at the same time. So they make no distinction between the competitive, in, like, they don't make a distinction between the freedom of a consumer, which I suggest would be regulated under consumer protection laws, and the freedom of developers, which I would say is regulated under the competition framework, but answer both of them at once and say that they have seen no competitive uh, distortions arise from the implementation of this system yet. And um, but we didn't look at it too carefully yet. Maybe we can ask a follow-up question, um, but at least they've been made aware that there is a case for it. And the only thing where I could kind of see myself going on along this line is along like, okay, but the consumer protection laws then, isn't there a consumer protection law that says that a consumer cannot be, kind of, when they buy their hardware, they can be forced into picking a solution which is bound this way. Um, but that would also kind of oblige me to prove that a consumer could actually be actively disadvantaged by the system. And because the consumer, I think, would normally be, be getting a code, I'm not sure that that would be the case. Um, it's, but it's kind of like an interesting mix of various legal topics. If you want to talk more about it, we can meet afterwards. I'm very pleased you talked quite a bit about fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory licensing of FRAN terms. Um, is the European Union going to do anything about industrial standards that are mandated to industry where the patent license holder refuses uh, its FRAN obligations specifically based on the fact that the software is open source? Um, I'm not sure that I understood. So there are certain patent holders that see that you're trying to get a patent license for, for, for the use of open source software. And as a result of that, because it, in fact, you know, because of the fact it's open source, ignores your request. Uh, very similar to the way the sort of mobile phone industry companies have been doing it, but that's on a much larger scale. Where, you know, uh, where the FRAN patent is just either refused or they ignore your requests, whereas the France system should at least s okay, start so a dialogue or some sort of negotiation. There's a bit of an, an, an echo, but it's about FRAND licensing and when a FRAND license is refused. Yes, on, on, um, on technical standards that are mandated by the on European technical Union. technical standards that are mandated by yes. the European Well, the Commission has a working group on this, but because I work in the European Parliament, we wouldn't 
uh, we decided the framework in which the European Commission can set up working groups to address these issues. And as far as I know, we've made a framework where in which the Commission has the option of making such a work group. And I've seen that DG Enterprise organizes workshops on these topics where they invite large stakeholders, including from the open source community. So, um, but it, like, it, the European Parliament, at least, I would assume, is not the right institution to be dealing with this problem um, because we cannot really change much in that. The European Commission tries, and I know that in the industrial policy that was recently released by the European Commission, they explicitly complain about patent thickets and um, patent pools and what do you do with standards and transparency. Like, it's almost impossible to find out who owns all of these patents. And I think that in the industrial policy, this is really becoming such a severe problem now that we need to in introduce some kind of transparency requirement. Like if you as, a, you as a company need to be starting to keep like files or so over which patents you, you think that you actually own or for specific standards or specific industrial areas. Um, and we're working on that, but the European in the European Parliament, it's been very, very difficult to get this type of wording through. And the European Parliament can sometimes be slightly um, decisive when it comes to very concrete topics like whether or not we want appropriate documentation or just documentation or something like this. Um, but when it comes to questioning things like intellectual, well, sorry, I should not use that word. Um, <laughs> so uh, when it comes to things like this entire bundle of immaterial rights and legal legal rights that we, entitlements that we give to private actors in society, um, we are very bad at looking past the enforcement debate and it's very, very locked and basically all of the undecided deputies will still default on enforcement and harsh punishments or something like this which makes any more nuanced discussion extremely difficult. Um, but I think the only way to solve that is by having a more aggressive kind of debate that may, may be a member state level so that politicians get incentivized to think about copyright or patents in non-enforcement terms. Um, but I want to be clear about that, like when we had the unitary patent discussions, it's not only software coders that are affected by this. Even the agri like breed plant breeding companies, and plant breeding companies are super huge, like the agricultural industrial complex, you know, go goes to the European Parliament and says, we need a breeder's exception. And the European Parliament is unable to provide that in the patent law. So, and this is, there by no means a disorganized little group of hobbyists. They're actually a very large industrial complex and still they have such extreme difficulties getting through in a patent law debate. And I think that really kind of symbolizes just how locked and messed up that political debate is. Uh, Okay, thank you. Any further questions? One more here. Uh, you mentioned that under European law, when someone develops software, a, a software developer, the copyright belongs to whoever uh, pays for his job. Um, but what is the situation when software is developed under European funding? Uh, so I'm thinking you know, Horizon 2020 is coming up a lot of software will be developed within that framework. Also, you talk of an image problem, the commission seeming like it's unfriendly to open source when it's actually trying to work for it. On the other hand, how much open source is actually running on the desktops of employees in the European Commission? Uh, isn't there maybe in sense of public procurement laws for others, but when it comes to applying it to oneself, what is the situation there? I mean, how much? There, there would be a, a very strong message being sent if the Commission itself were to adopt these principles. So on the first question, it's re European research funding used to develop software. Does it become open source? And the answer is it depends on what the software was developed for. Normally it will be the people that uh, are participating in the project that make the decision on how to release the proceeds of, of, their, um, of their project. 
Uh, in the Horizon 2020 framework program, which is kind of the new research funds, the European Commission has made a very, very strong push towards more open access and more open publication of results and data and everything affiliated with the process. The European Parliament decided to be more cautious about accepting the virtues of openness in a way that at least I am strongly critical of. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why the Parliament went that way, because we've been more conservative than industry, and there was really no good reason for us to be that. But I think somebody just had a mental lapse and didn't realize what they were doing. Um, so, but, but when it comes to projects that are developed as common infrastructures, and even actually the very technical projects, if you look at privacy enhancing technologies, for instance, or uh, the European Union does a lot of work with that, anything almost that goes towards the e-government sector, unless you have a very, very strong industrial player participating in that project, they will normally become open also open source because the Commission prefers that. Now on your second question, why does the European institutions use Microsoft products in all of their um, end user terminals? This is very simple because they are the only actor which is capable of providing a technical infrastructure for maybe 30,000 people or so or 35,000 people. And I happen to know that even if you were to disagree with the way that the European Commission does its procurement, because it's done centrally at DG Digit, I think, which is a unit at the Commission that does procurement. Um, and they publish these tenders and then they get replies and then they deploy the infrastructure in all of the uh, European institutions. And if you have a problem with the way that you're doing that, you would have to challenge the procurement proceedings. So there are some legitimate claims that you could make. They publish the tenders too soon. They make requirements that obviously can only be fulfilled by one vendor, that kind of thing. But when the Free Software Foundation in Europe has been looking for companies from the free software sector, to challenge the way that the European Commission does its procurement, they haven't found any. And at some point, if you're looking to go into the procurement at the European level and you have a problem with the way that we get our software solutions, you have a legal instrument with which you can challenge the way they did their procurement. And if you are unable to find anyone willing to do that, actually, it's not the, because we will still need our computers to work. So for us, kind of in the meantime, then, using this solution, um, so, but, but if I think that Karsten Gerloff at the Free Software Foundation in Europe, nobody would be any happier than he would be if you went to him and said, listen, I'm a free software provider. I think that I could fix the European institutions. Please help me challenge DigiDidit and their procurement. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, one right up at the back. Go on. Hi, uh, this is a two-part question uh, concerning public procurement. Uh, first part is, uh, is it actually legal for a European state to say, uh, I will not accept the, your tender because it is based on open source and I don't want that? And the second part is, is it legal for a European state to say, I will not accept your tender if it doesn't already work as a uh, as software in another country? So the question is whether or not we would be to, be, whether or not we would be allowed to make a law at the member state level that refuses a software solution that isn't open or free. Yes. Uh, and the, so second, and the, the second question was? The second question is, uh, is it a valid requirement to say that uh, for my state to accept this software it has to be installed in another country as well. In order for me to procure this software, it would have to be sold in another member state as well? Yes, uh, if uh, it is legal to say that for this tender, I will only accept software that is already installed in another state. On the first question, I don't no, actually. I'm not sure if you're allowed to at, make a law in the member state that prohibits the procurement of specific software, like th that prohibits the procurement of proprietary software. I would assume that you can only make, but maybe it depends on the institutional framework in the member state as well. 
So, because you have lots of different levels of, in, in Sweden I would find that difficult to see how the government could make such a law, since our municipalities have a very high degree of autonomy, but I really wouldn't be able to tell. And then on the second question, um, again, I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer, and prob it could depend between the members no, because that's a cross-border issue, so that would have to be European legislation. I um, have no idea. Something to take away and think about. Right, well, we're coming up to uh, 10 to 1, so I think we'll, we'll draw a line under this debate here.